Okay, I think we can uh, we can start. So welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, new version of the Nano Seminars. Uh, this is a fully virtual version this time. Um, so we're going to have two talks: one introductory talk and then one main main event. Um, so the introductory talk will be given uh, by Isaac Alcon, who is a postdoc in the group of Stefan Roche. Uh, who joined the group uh, just earlier this year, and he will present some uh, some of his uh, results. So please, Isaac, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Klaas. Um, so I will share my screen. Yeah, I'm Isaac Alcon, and I will show some of the results on nanoporous graphene, which is a material that actually was uh, first synthesized in, at ICN2, and uh, I did some work during my first two postdocs, and uh, which then connect with the work that I'm essentially doing now at the, at the theoretical and computational uh, nanoscience group uh, led by Stefan Broch. So I will talk about my previous results, and then I briefly will say what, what I'm studying uh, working now. So, um, yeah, so this essentially was a uh, work that was initiated by uh, Aitor Mugarza, the team of Aitor Mugarza and, and Cesar Moreno. And this was the bottom up synthesis, uh, on surface synthesis of the so called nanoporous graphene, um, starting from these molecules, polymerizing to graphene nanoribbons, which then kind of assembled in a lateral way, forming this kind of array, parallel array of graphene nanoribbons, which with nearly atomic precision. This material generated a lot of attention in the scientific community. And uh, one of the studies, one of the theoretical studies was actually conducted by uh, Mats Brambjuk at the Technical University of Denmark, who studied the uh, uh, simulated the injection of electrons in this material by an STM chip. And what, it, what he found was that if you inject uh, with, with, with this STM chip, the currents near to the, to the STM chip actually get con are kind of confined on a single graphene nanoribbon, but far from the source, and this is a large scale piece of this nanoporous graphene, what, he, what they got was that the uh, currents actually spread through the entire material. So at the time I started my first postdoc at their team and they were kind of interested to see if there was a chemical way to actually kind of play more and kind of confine these currents, uh, collimate them. And I proposed to uh, kind of connect the graphene nanoribbons via these benzene rings. And then depending in principle, depending on the connectivity through these benzene rings, whether this is para connection or meta connection, in principle, the in the meta connection, destructive, destructive quantum interference should take place in the ring. And that should, you know, kind of confine the currents in a single graphene nanoribbon because they should become electronically isolated. So for that, we uh, build up larger scale devices of these para and meta MPG uh, devices, nanoporous graphenes, which are 80 nanometers wide and more than 100 nanometers uh, long. And we injected in these dots at the, at the bottom of each device. And in the para MPG, the current is spread like very similarly as the fabricated nanoporous graphene. But in the meta MPG, the currents are fully confined on a single graphene nanoribbon uh, as you can see here through these bond current uh, maps. Now, the problem with this is with these two materials is that these are really static. So if you want to get confinement, I mean, you cannot go from one to the other, you have to synthesize a new material. So then the next question that we asked ourselves was like, okay, whether there is one material that could actually have this thing, but in a single platform and then tune it with an external knock. knock. And for that, we thought about kinons. Uh, because kinons also host this quantum interference. This has been shown in single molecule devices, but uh, by electrochemical reduction, by for instance, hydrogenation, this quantum interference is removed. So this was shown that, you know, by varying the pH of your system, the conductivity, the conductance through this small single molecule device could be tuned because you were kind of activating and deactivating this quantum interference. So uh, our next proposition was to actually have designed this uh, new nanoporous graphene that were now as a bridge, we would use these kinons so that we could actually activate and deactivate the quantum interference by electrochemical means. Uh, the main, uh, so um, one, one, one quick way to actually see uh, what's going on on the, on the uh, kinon uh, 
horizontal graphene is also to look at the banner structures. So these are the banner structures of the para MPG and the meds MPG. And you can see that in the para MPG, where the graphene nanoribbons are electronically coupled, uh, there is a, a splitting of, of, the, of these bands near the Fermi level, which are the ones that actually conduct the electrons. There is this delta K at a particular energy. Contrary, in the MET-MPG, where you have quantum interference, these two bands are overlapped. And so this delta K is zero. And this is kind of like a proof of quantum interference and so confinement of currents. Now, in the kinoidal MPG, what happens is that we have kind of both at the same time. You can see that for the conduction band, the, there is a splitting, and so there is uh, electronic connection between the graphene nanoribbons, neighboring graphene nanoribbons, and contrary, in the valence band, there is this quantum interference going on. And then here we have, inside of the gap, uh, we have this flat band, which then, if you look at the projected density of states, you, we can see that this flat state is essentially the kinoidal electrons, which are, of course, localized and so flat. So to actually play with the uh, kind of electronic uh, electronics of this material, we essentially applied uh, a gate. So in our simulation in DFT, we, um, sorry, I didn't say that, uh, all this is density functional theory and then using parameterized track binding models from those DFT calculations. So in our DFT periodic calculation, we included this plane of charge that then generated the counter charge on our material. And so we could dope it in this way. And then using uh, DFT parameterized that binding, we could take that, those Hamiltonians and see what happens for the larger scale uh, systems. Now, so for a uh, small gate, so for a small concentration of holes, we are really, our Fermi level is at the onset of this band. And just, you can see that the quantum interference doesn't take place effectively. But then applying larger gates, uh, so kind of putting more holes in, in our system, then we put our Fermi level right at the quantum interference point, and then the full confinement of currents takes place. So you can see already that here, just by some small uh, kind of playing with the gate, we can you, you can already go from the spreading to the confinement. Now, what happens if instead of uh, doping with holes, you would uh, dope with electrons? This is more complicated because uh, we saw that when you dope with electrons, you are essentially filling this flat band and when you fill that flat band, it gets spin polarized. And uh, by increasing the, the gate, so in, kind of increasing the uh, negative doping, that flat band, uh, spin polarized band, kind of coupled with the conduction uh, band. And so that conduction band also got spin polarized. Now, this spin polarization essentially arises from the bridges because by putting these electrons, we are kind of creating kind of a radical state in this kinon which gets spin polarized. Then the coupling between the bridges is, magnetic coupling is quite a small. So these two electronic solutions spin up, down, and sorry, spin down, up, and up, up. They are almost degenerate, which means that if you apply a magnetic field on this material, you could actually induce this electronic solution. So for spintronics, this is the most interesting one. And that's the one that we studied for the larger scale uh, transport simulations. And uh, this is essentially what we got here. So we took this solution, the ferromagnetically coupled, that in principle you should get under a magnetic field. And uh, we constructed the larger scale and got the bond current. And you can see that this is a bit more complicated, right? Because you have a spreading on the one hand, but also confinement at the same time. And to understand this, we had to look at the spin polarization of this bond current. If you take a look at that, then it's very easy to understand what's going on. So you can see, that the currents that are spread are only the ones uh, for the spin up channel. And that makes sense because that's the, 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 the spin channel that we are filling on our kinons. So the kinons are being filled with electrons on the spin up channel. So quantum interference is uh, kind of removed only in that spin channel. And so the, the, the bridges are opened. And so the currents are spread on that channel. Contrary for a spin down, uh, the, the, the kind of the channels, the, 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 the bridges are not filled. And so still you have quantum interference for spin down electrons. And so they get confined. So this material, it seems that could be used potentially as a spin filter because you could inject currents which are not spin polarized. And then uh, via this application of, magne of a magnetic field, this material would actually separate a spin up and a spin down current uh, spatially. 
So uh, what uh, we are interested uh, or what, what one of the main purposes of what uh, I'm, I'm doing at the, the team of at the group of Stefan Roche is uh, to kind of uh, have into account temperature effects because all these um, all the results that I just showed are all of them at zero Kelvin because all the structures are frozen, are fixed. Uh, so, and of course, temperature could have a strong effect in all these kind of phenomena that we're showing. So for that, essentially what we're going to do uh, at, at the Stefan Roche uh, group is to kind of simulate the, uh, the, the electronics on thermally activated structures like the one that I'm showing here. Uh, which is the Met MPG at 300 Kelvin. This is one, one snapshot. So I'm doing that mainly with uh, Aaron Cummins and Alejandro Antidormi. And essentially the approach that we are uh, following is to uh, kind of do molecular dynamics on these large scale systems with lamps. So with using uh, force fields. And then we on uh, taking a snapshots on uh, during these molecular dynamics, we, we do a statistics, we take like something like 100 snapshots then we study uh, what happens with the electronics. And we will do this in two ways. One, the main way will be through linear scaling quantum transport uh, methodology, which is based on, on the Kubo uh, formula for conductivity for transport, which is kind of the main uh, theoretical frame for larger scale electronics developed at the group of uh, Stefan Roche. And we will also do it using uh, the transiesta, which is based on uh, Green's functions, which uh, is actually all the results that I showed before are based on, on this other uh, kind of approach. And this will be done uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, researchers at the Technical University of, of Denmark. And so, well, this is essentially the, the main goal of my uh, stay at the group of Stefan. And uh, yeah, hopefully in some time we will have our results that I will be glad to, to show at ICM2 as well. But yeah, this is essentially what I'm working on uh, now. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Isaac. Thank you very much for this uh, for this nice talk. Yeah. Um, so I'm having a look at the chat to see if there's any questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the meantime, I can, I can ask you a question. So at some point you were showing uh, for neutral um, uh, for a neutral situation that you have these flat bands occurring yeah um so of course flat bands in carbon-based materials uh does mm -hmm. that mean you can also get some nice correlation effects or things like this uh could be could be i don't know if in this one but yeah yeah absolutely absolutely uh and and i think it's not this is just one case where you actually get this but uh i think that depending if you play with the structure of your material you can get a lot of actual materials where you have this sort of states. Yeah, absolutely. Be I think because so. because it, it looks very similar to the to the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, right? I mean, just looking at this. Yeah. At this band diagram. Yeah, I'm not that much of an expert of, with the magic angle. I know that there are some kind of localized states, but uh, yeah, if if at some point you want to give us some input, I will be glad to to listen any parallelism. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Good. Any more questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Uh, the Q&A. Yeah, okay. No. Okay, then I think we're yeah. gonna move on. So thank you very much again, Isaac. Yeah. We'll now move on to the main speaker of today. Yeah. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Floris Swanenburg. So Floris is an associate professor at the University of Twente at the Mesa Plus Institute for Nanotechnology uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, where he's heading an independent research line uh, within the nanoelectronics group. Uh, he's an expert, I think we can even say one of the pioneers uh, in silicon quantum electronics. Um, he's been an associate professor since 2015. Before that, he was an assistant professor since 2011. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, um, and he did his PhD uh, at uh, uh, the University of Technology in Delft. Uh, his advisor was Leo Kauwenhoven. Uh, he obtained his PhD in 2008, I think, if that's correct. Uh, he was also a visiting researcher uh, at Harvard University, um, and he has many sources of funding, European projects, uh, national projects, um, and he's very much used to giving talks, including 
what I read in his CV, a talk at the largest motocross event in the world, <laughs> which is the Zwarte Cross in, uh, in the eastern part of Holland, uh, with more than 100,000 participants. So um, I think that that's quite an impressive number. Uh, so we very much look forward to your talk. Uh, Flores, please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Klaas Jan. I still vividly remember when our paths crossed uh, indeed more than 15 years ago. And actually today I looked up your old master thesis and I, I may still have a few, no, I don't have a few questions about that. But there's actually one topic uh, that I'll present today that's related to it. Um, and uh, indeed I've given a talk at this, at this festival that hosts in principle 100,000 people in total. But then of course it's only a small outreach part where there's maybe uh, 20, 30 people or so present that, uh, that come to, to a nice outreach talk about science. So it's really pleasant to be able to, to spread the word, uh, what we do with, uh, the EU and, and national funding in order to uh, to, to increase the, the knowledge uh, say of, of, of mankind. So it's, uh, it's good to give something back to the people and to, to do it in outreach. In any case, um, today I'll be talking about silicon and germanium quantum electronics. Um, and what we hope to do is to, to work toward the, the quantum technology of the future. And I want to leverage the, the existing technology, especially for silicon, but potentially also for germanium, that already exists for uh, for integrated circuits and see if we can use that for this future quantum technology. And the reason I haven't put up my presentation yet is just so you can see my face a little bit longer uh, be because of this, this distance you always have in these online webinars. But I'm going to, to move to the to the slides now. So uh, I hope you'll be able to, to manage to see uh, both the presentation and, um, uh, and also that I can still communicate it properly to all of you. So let's see. Share presentation at uh, this opening slide and uh, of course I'll be presenting the work of all the, uh, that has been done by the, the main people so I first like to start with giving them the credits this is the current team in my uh, in my group here in Twente so I've got five PhD students two postdocs and I collaborate a lot with uh, Professor Alexander Brinkman uh, on the right also I'd like to give credit to, to the rest of the group in the bottom left uh, the nano electronics group does more than just quantum electronics for example, uh, colleague Wilfred van der Wiel leads a team on neuromorphic electronics, uh, trying to make brain-inspired nanostructures for different kinds of uh, electronics for the future. Also today, I'll present work that's been reached together with uh, collaborators across, uh, across Europe. So uh, mostly uh, Erik Bakkers, very important to grow our high-quality nanowires, but also Erwin Kessels from uh, Eindhoven and colleagues in Basel, uh, Braakman, Zumbiel, Daniel Loss and Christian Schoenebeek. So the main motivation for our work to do, to study silicon and germanium quantum electronics is to make a step towards a future quantum technology. And what we would like to do is to, to make important steps towards reliable and scalable quantum electronic devices. So what we do in the lab is that we make in our academic clean rooms these quantum electronic devices, and we hope that we can uh, leverage, as said, the, uh, the technology that exists for germanium and for silicon to make more reliable and also scalable devices. And we all know that, that there is this silicon technology, but how can you really make the step in a feasible way, not just by using a little bit of silicon, but also to actually um, to do this? Well, this is our strategy, which you can see on the slide. Uh, we try to develop new concepts for high quality devices. So you need high quality materials, you get them in house and then you need to make, to keep the high quality while you make a complete device out of it. And that's not trivial. What we then do is that we study the underlying physics and we want to unravel the fundamental physics and study, for example, the spin physics or all our quantum phenomena. But what we do in a quantum labs is often quite far away from what happens in, uh, um, uh, in industry. If you think about a company like, like Intel or, uh, or, or other foundries for, of CMOS technology, they've got a completely different approach. If we in our academic clean rooms, we make a thousand devices and one works, then we'll uh, we'll be jumping up and down, shouting, and try to publish it in nature. If at Intel they make uh, a wafer and out of a thousand devices, one doesn't work, they want to know why this one does not work. So those worlds are really quite far apart. And we try to make a step towards them in different projects, as I will show you today. And we try to partner up with them where we teach them new concepts that we get out of our devices. And at the same time, uh, we measure some of their devices and give them feedback on what works and what doesn't work. So I try to use the, the strengths that we have in, uh, in Twente. So uh, in Twente, I'm in the, the nanoelectronics group, and that's part of the Mesa Plus Institute for Nanotechnology. 
we have our own nano lab, our clean room facilities. And inside these clean room facilities, we have an ultra clean silicon processing line, meaning it's very well protected from contamination. For example, using gold is strictly forbidden in uh, nearly all machines. And also three, five materials are, you can't just get them into the clean room because they often contaminate everything. That's good for our silicon devices. It's sometimes limiting for the, for the, uh, for the experiments we'd like to do. Also, we have a great deal of expertise in thin film growth. For example, high quality uh, atomic layer deposition dielectrics, but also all the kinds of, uh, of layer depositions. In our group, we are experts in low temperature electron transport. And that's the, the expertise, the background that I share with uh, Klaas Thielroy. These are the two material systems that I work on and that I will tell you about today. So I'll give you a summary of the, the key results on both the, the 1D system uh, mostly the germanium nanowires, and also on the 2D system we have in house on the planar silicon quantum bus. And these are the results of the last uh, five or six years or so. Uh, I'll first start with a short summary of the, of the key projects that I have running right now. So what you see here is uh, an overview of the two, uh, two projects which are on the, on the nanowires. Above there's a FET open project that I coordinate. It's on germanium nanowires, and we try to create topologically protected states in these, uh, these nanowires. Uh, this is a very hot field, but also a field of great discussion, as we've seen in the last few years. And we still hope to make important steps towards uh, proving topological states, or at least do interesting physics with these superconducting, semiconducting structures. We also have a new Dutch project, an NWO, that is the Dutch National Science Foundation, where we try to create higher order topological states in telluride nanowires. And currently, we have these four people you see on the right here who, uh, who are the, the team on these, these nanowires. All these nanowires are grown by, uh, by our collaborators in Anglo. Now, in the 2D system, we have these projects running. There's one EU project on scalable spin qubits. And indeed, this is a project where we have academic groups collaborating with uh, global foundries or foundry-like uh, uh, like institutions like IMEC and Letty. And what we need to do is measure their devices and see if we can make uh, scalable or reproducible qubits. In parallel, we try to make devices in our own academic clean room right here, where we try to realize spin qubits with long quantum lifetimes. And one project that we have running right now is to make single atom spin qubits, uh, similar to uh, the way uh, Andrea Morello does that at the UNSW in Sydney. But we do this with bismuth atoms. And we want to use the individual spin that's bound to this bismuth atom as a spin qubit. And this is actually in collaboration with two theory partners, one from uh, Madrid, uh, Maria Calderon, and uh, also a theorist from UNSW, that's Dimitri Kulcher. Now in the future, we hope to go, uh, and that's something where we're working on right now, is to couple spins and photons uh, using direct band gap germanium silicon. Erik Bakkers has been able to grow this uh, germanium silicon in a different crystal structure, hexagonal instead of diamond structure. And if it's hexagonal, then it can have a direct band gap. So if we can use that, we hope that we can create spin qubits and use the spin manipulation tricks of the electrons and then convert that spin state to a photon state to use the strong quantum communication properties of uh, photons. So ideally, we hope to get, get the best of both in this project. Now, as I said, we collaborate with, uh, with IMEC. I've had a collaboration, collaboration with them uh, since about three years or so. Um, and what we do is that we hope to make the step from academic quantum devices to these CMOS compatible devices. So here on the left on this slide, I'll turn on my, my pointer. That may also help to uh, know where we are. And what you see here is on the left, a TEM, uh, electron micro, uh, transmission electron microscope picture of a device that we make in Twente. That's on a chip, of course. And this is one of our small chips that we uh, that we make in our clean room facilities, and we then measure those devices. The concept that we learn are picked up by IMEC here on the right. And what IMEC does is that they can make these devices on 300 millimeter wafers. That's what you see here on the right. It's a 300 millimeter wafer for quantum device technologies. However, when we measure those devices, they don't yet have the properties of our quantum device that we make in our clean room. So we give them feedback on what works, what doesn't work, and they try to integrate it in the process and improve it. Um, and this is really an interesting field. The question is if you can, how far you can, can bring this and if we can indeed go towards some kind of scalable uh, quantum integrated circuits or so. And this is well described by the review I, uh, you see here in the bottom right. Uh, it's, it's been on the archive for about a year or so and it should be in Nature Electronics uh, by next year. And that's a very good uh, uh, view on the challenges to, 
to use this, this, this CMOS compatibility really for scalable quantum devices. So these are the results that I will present to you today. I'll start with uh, the germanium nanowires and show you our results on uh, quantum dots and also on how we can get superconductivity in them. And then I'll move to the planar silicon quantum dots. Um, and this is all uh, summarized already in this slide. So this is a heads up for what will be coming. We'll be seeing single quantum dots, as you can see here in upper right. We'll see double quantum dots and poly spin blockade uh, in the middle picture. And some superconductivity we'll see uh, in the last part. These nanowires, as I said, are grown by uh, the group of Erik Buckers in Eindhoven. And they, they're grown from a, a catalyst particle that you can see over here. So in this case, this is actually a gold particle. And there's a crystalline silicon nanowire below it. If you zoom in, you can indeed see the, the crystalline structure in the center. And of course, the, uh, the, the shell can oxidize and therefore turn into an amorphous oxide. For this specific project, we use germanium silicon core shell nanowires. So as you can see in the cartoon on the left, we have a core that's made of germanium of about 20 nanometers. And there's a silicon shell around it of about one to five nanometers or so. And because of the different band gaps, we get this uh, so-called staggered band alignment. Uh, it's called a, it's a type two staggered band alignment. And this alignment makes sure that the Fermi energy in the core is below the, the top of the valence band. So you get free holes, free accumulation of holes inside your nanowire without having to add any dopants, because the dopants often also give you uh, give you a, a, um, a disorder. And that gives you very favorable transport properties. Besides that, um, it's also been predicted there's a strong spin orbit interaction in these nanowires. And it can be used, for example, for electric field driven spin qubits, that, which has been done actually last year, but also to create topological states as predicted by, uh, uh, by Daniel Loss and uh, Jelena Klingerbaya. Now we get these nanowires on a substrate, as you see in this uh, electron microscope image on the upper right. And then we still need to make a device out of them. But we can pick up individual nanowires, as you see on this slide. So the big triangular thing that's coming in from the right, that's, um, this is our, uh, our uh, micro manipulator. And at the tip, it's about 200 nanometers. And if you play right with it, we can pick up individual nanowires from this growth substrate, this growth substrate. And then you can deposit it on a clean substrate and make your device, as we've done right here. Now, in this case, it's a fairly uh, advanced device. So we start off, uh, as you can see, in the schematic cross section on the right. We start off with a backgate substrate, highly doped uh, silicon. We have silicon oxide on top. And then we first define, in this case, a set of six gates. And on these gates, we deposit aluminum oxide. On top of those, we deposit then our nanowire. And then the final step, then we make the, these big source drain contacts to the nanowire. That means we can send current through the device and then use these gates to control the transports inside them. And the first experiment you can think of, at least the first one that we did, is to create a quantum dot between two barriers. So here on the right, you can see a schematic of those uh, six gates below the nanowire and then the wire itself in green. And if we use these two gates indicated in blue to locally pull up a tunnel barrier, we can create a quantum dot right in between. And what you see here in this measurement is uh, the conductance through this uh, electrostatically defined quantum dot. And just to be clear, this is electrostatically defined. So it's not a, a nanoparticle quantum dot, but uh, we define the confinement, the last layer of confinement uh, uh, by, these, by, these, uh, by these gates. And then the other two uh, confinement directions are determined by the nanowire itself, by the material. So what you see here is the conductance in color scale versus the source drain voltage and the, the, the voltage on the gate. That's this middle gate here in orange. And with that gate, we can uh, add or remove individual electrons, or in this case, holes, from the nanowire. So inside these Coulomb-shaped, uh, these diamond-shaped regions, we have Coulomb blockade. And the number of holes on the quantum dot is constant. And by then changing the gate voltage, we can add or remove one hole at a time from our quantum dot. So this is a discretization of charge that we can see in this measurement. Now we can make this quantum dot in between these two gates, but we can also use another pair of gates to make the quantum dot a bit bigger or to take even further gates apart, or even in, in our layout, the, the, the gates that are furthest apart spaced by about 450 nanometers. 
This means that we have a quantum dot of about 500, uh, of about half a micron long. And it's relatively clean. It's not only this uh, incredible control we have, no, uh, it's also very robust. So what you can see here is a measurement, a 30 hour measurement of this uh, nearly half a micron long quantum dot. And in this case, we can remove about 160 holes from the dot. And if you look at the conductance, if you at the gate voltage, it goes from minus two volts here to plus two volts there, then we can see it's extremely stable. There's only a few charge switches over this entire gate range in about 30 hours. And it's so stable that we can make these kind of quantum dots, but we can also split a single quantum dot in two quantum dots. And that's what you see in these four measurements here. So on the left, we have one big quantum dot defined between these two blue gates. And then as we go to the right, we do the same measurement, but in the meanwhile, we increase the voltage on this middle barrier. And that splits this single quantum dot into two quantum dots, two quantum dot islands. And then we go from, um, from intermediate coupling to weak coupling, and in the end to, to nearly uncoupled quantum dots in these two nano, in these two, uh, in this nanowire. We studied this in even more detail, and then we could observe poly spin blockade. So what you see in this measurement is uh, what we call a charge stability diagram of the charge occupation of both quantum dots. For example, here we see uh, this one one between brackets. This means that we have effectively one hole on each quantum dot island. In fact, we think we, we don't know the exact whole number. We have roughly 70 holes on, uh, uh, on each quantum dot. So it could be 71, 71, but we don't know this exact. But what we do know based on more specific measurements is that here in the zero zero region, we have two effectively filled shells. And the filled shells means that we indeed can go effectively to adding one hole to the next shell in one dot or the other dot in the zero one state or one in each. And then we can study poly spin blockade by going from the one one to the two zero transition or from the one one to, to the zero two transition. But what then happens in this poly spin blockade is that we can have two electrons or two holes in this case, of course, with both the same spin assigned. And then uh, it's not allowed to go to the same quantum state, of course, because of the Pauli exclusion principle. So we can have a complete blockage of the current due to this fundamental quantum mechanical principle. And we use this first of all, of course, to observe this Pauli spin blockade, but also to study the spin flip mechanisms inside these nanowires. Well, that's all been described in this paper by uh, Matthias Brauns of uh, about five years ago or so. And what we found out is that in most cases, it's a so-called process called spin flip co-tunneling that limits the, uh, the poly spin blockade, or actually the, the, the leakage current. And in some instances, we could observe that it was a spin orbit coupling in these wires that was limiting the, the spin flip rates. All right, that brings me to the superconducting measurements. Um, so what we've done as well is to deposit these nanowires on a, on a substrate without any predefined gate, as you see here on the left, and then deposit these gates on top, in this case, aluminum gates. Of course, aluminum is a superconductor. And if we then cool down this device to uh, below the critical temperature of aluminum, critical temperature of aluminum, we can see this uh, superconducting state inside the nanowires. So here you see the measured voltage over the two probes versus the sourced current. And here, in this part, we have zero voltage, meaning we have a supercurrent. Now, if we then increase the current up to the, the switching current, then it switches from the superconducting state to the normal state, um, and, and it's behaving normal again. This means we've uh, introduced superconductivity in the nanowire. But the nanowire itself is still semiconductor. So by applying an electric field to the nanowire, we can control the superconducting state through it. So this is a supercurrent transistor. And what you see in these measurements is that by changing indeed the voltage on the, on the back gate, we can control the effective supercurrent or critical current through the nanowire. Now this has been done before in, uh, in other different measurements. Uh, the, the first instance was already in 2006, uh, specifically in these type of nanowires, but then it took a very long time before it was reproduced. And we took it a step further as you can see in these measurements. So here you see a color plot of uh, the uh, resistance as a function of, uh, again, the source current here on the y-axis and the gate voltage or the electric field on the x-axis. In this region, this dark region, we indeed have a supercurrent, there's zero conductor, uh, sorry, zero resistance. And at this white edge, every time we switch to the normal state. 
So in this left part of this um, of this plot, we are in what we call the Josephson junction regime or the supercurrent transistor. So if you look at uh, the schematic uh, electrochemical potential diagram here on the left, we've got two superconducting densities of states on the left and on the right. And here in the center, we've got the nanowire segment where we have a, a normal uh, semiconductor. Now, if we have enough overlap of the wave functions of the two superconductors, the supercurrent can indeed run through the nanowire. And we can then, then change the effective height of the critical current by changing the, the normal state resistance of the, of the nanowire. But we see that here on the right, something funny is going on. We lose, at some instances, the supercurrent entirely. And this is because we've entered what we call the, the quantum dot regime. So by depleting, by going to uh, less negative gate voltage, in here on the right, even above zero gate voltage, we deplete more and more holes from this nanowire. And at some moment, we get two tunnel barriers at the superconductor semiconductor interface in such a way that we create a quantum dot. So now we get this combination of two superconductors and this charge discretization inside the nanowire. And in this diagram, we have single particle levels here indicated in uh, orangey yellow, uh, and they can yes or not be resonant with uh, the Fermi level of the superconductor. Now, of course, if they're not resonant, if then nothing's happening. That's, for example, here, let's say in this, uh, this uh, white region here, there's no supercurrent at all. But if one of these levels is resonant with the Fermi level of the superconductor, then we can get a supercurrent through, for example, right here in this dark black region or in this region. And that's actually kind of counterintuitive because on the one hand, you've got uh, infinite conductivity. And at the same time, of course, in Coulomb blockage, you've got infinite resistance. So it's like you're multiplying infinity with, with zero. What do you get? Well, if you're in the right regime, then you can still get your supercurrent to tunnel through your quantum dot. So you get Cooper pairs going through single particle levels. And this can happen if the tunnel coupling of the quantum dot to the source and drain is uh, strong enough. Because, um, in fact, maybe the, the word single particle level no longer applies. If this tunnel coupling get, gets so high that your uh, that the wave function overlap of your um, uh, of, of your single particle levels with the source and drain is, is so great, then then this single particle picture uh, sort of falls apart. So what we've done then is then to deplete this quantum dot entirely of uh, of its holes. And um, uh, what you see here is a, a normal state measure. So here we've turned on the magnetic field up to two Tesla. So we know for sure that there's no superconductivity in the system. And in the measurement in the upper right, we, you can see we completely drain the quantum dot of the hole. So it's really entirely empty. And on the bottom left here, so right here, you can see that we've got the same depletion region on the right. And then here we found by some, some careful analysis uh, where we see the last hole transitions. So these are the D1 to D6, so the diamonds one to diamond six of the first up to the sixth hole or so. And this is where we can still see the supercurrents uh, when these particle levels are resonant with uh, the source and drain leads. So this tells us that we've been able to create, um, to, to send the Josephson current through a few whole quantum dots. And if you'd like to know more, I'd, I advise you to look at, uh, at our paper in advanced materials of uh, three years ago or so. Uh, and then one of the other ones, you can also see the Shapiro steps in another device. That's the last nano letters that appeared uh, a year ago. All right, that brings me to the to the second topic. I'll move now from 1D to 2D and look at the time. Yeah, that should be fine. So uh, what I'll show you is how we've been able to make uh, ambipolar devices. So to make both electron and hole quantum dots, how we've been playing around with different device geometries to see how that affects the device. And then use some actually unexpected effects to, for example, make depletion mode quantum dots. Now the system we use is uh, what you see here in the in the left part. It's the the, the quantum dot system introduced by Susan Engels et al. Uh, in 2008 uh, at UNSW, the University of New South Wales. And uh, it consists of intrinsic silicon substrate. Then far away it has a source drain contacts. Um, on top there's a thin silicon oxide. Uh, and on top of those, we've got a set of uh, barrier gates. So that's aluminum gates here, B1 and B2, to control the, the tunnel barriers. And then uh, uh, perpendicular to it, we've got this big lead that helps us to induce the two-dimensional electron gas. So what happens then, if you look at this top view here in the bottom left, then uh, the leads are the reservoirs. They can send the electrons from left to right or right to left. And then the barriers can create a quantum node right here in the heart of the structure. 
This has been the workhorse for all the uh, spin qubit results from, uh, from Australia uh, by, uh, by Morello, Zurich, and Hamilton. So also the, the single atom spin qubits, but uh, also the quantum dot spin qubits, uh, they all rely on this specific device. Now, what we've done in Twente for the first time is to make this ambipolar. So we connected this, this barrier structure to, of course, n-type source drain, but also to p-type source drain. So you could choose to send holes through them or electrons through them by changing the, the gate voltage. And that's exactly what you see in this measurement. So in the upper right, we can see the, these Coulomb diamonds showing us that we can make, in this case, an electron quantum dot by applying positive gate voltages. But we can also apply negative gate voltage in the bottom right to create a whole quantum dot. And these electron and whole quantum dot are in exactly the same piece of silicon. So it's sensitive to the same silicon oxide, the same defect, the same uh, metal on top of it. So it helps us to compare, for example, if you'd like to do that, spin qubits, whole spin qubits, and electron spin qubits, and see how they, how they react to the same environment. Now, in the last few years, we've changed the design a little bit. And what we've now done is to create a electron quantum dot right next to a whole quantum dot. And we want them to sense each other. So what I'll show you now is that we can perform ambipolar charge sensing. And these are separated by about 100 nanometers so that they have a finite capacitive coupling to each other. Meaning that if we add or remove an electron or a hole from the SET or from the, the SHT, so the single hole transistor, the other one can sense it. And that's what you see in these measurements. So this color plot here on the left shows uh, Coulomb peaks of the electron uh, of the single electron transistor. And here on the right, you see one big whole peak of the single hole transistor. And if you look carefully at these line traces here at the bottom, you can see indeed in green here uh, about 10, 12 uh, electron peaks. And you see this white hole peak. And every time an electron is removed from uh, the, the SET, we see this upset here and here and here of the whole current. So this is where the single hole transistor senses electrons from, uh, from the electron uh, dot. We can also invert this and even do this simultaneously. So now we see here about 12 uh, electron peaks in this left picture and uh, about 10 whole peaks in this right picture. And if we carefully study them and, uh, and, uh, and plot the, the data a bit differently, so here the derivative, we can see that again, they upset each other every time we go from, uh, we add or remove one whole or one electron. So this is simultaneous uh, ambipolar charge sensing. Finally, we've also performed active charge sensing. Active charge sensing means that you uh, position your, your charge sensor on the flank of a peak where it's most sensitive to changes in the electric field. And then you, uh, with a feedback loop, you every time you get an upset, you, you change it back, you move it back to the, to the flank where it's still most sensitive. That's what you see in these measurements. So here you can see that uh, uh, we can do this active charge sensing, and it's much more sensitive than the, than the passive sensing I've shown you just now. And it also allowed us to go to the few hole regime in this device. So this is the signal on the, the SET showing that we can get the occupation of the whole quantum dot. In this case, the whole quantum dot split up onto two quantum dots. And you can see here that in the upper right, we've uh, removed all the holes from this double quantum dot. We can then add one hole to the left dot, one to the right dot, or one in each dot. So these are the results of our ambipolar quantum dots. And now what we've done is to, to study these gates and oxides to optimize the, the devices. But it really depends on what you'd like to do. Now I said this is the, the electron layout as introduced uh, at UNSW. So what, what they do and what we started to do in, in 20 is to do, uh, deposit this aluminum on top of the silicon oxide. And then they oxidize it in air. And what happens is that you not only get an aluminum oxide on top of the aluminum, but also it directly starts to exist at the interface of the aluminum and the silicon oxide. The reason is that aluminum has a stronger affinity to the oxygen atoms than silicon. So it eats away some of the oxygen. And you can see that this original layer of silicon oxide is eaten into by this aluminum. So it means that, that, that it's not atomically sharp, clearly not. We had some issues in Twente, first of all, to make these reproducible quantum dots, but also uh, the grain size of the aluminum can be so big that, that sometimes the aluminum gates do not uh, conduct anymore. So we decided to work with uh, different materials, for example, palladium and titanium, as you see here. Now, of course, palladium is a noble metal, which is good because it, um, 
Uh, it doesn't react with all the materials. At the same time, it doesn't have this nice native oxide as our aluminum. So we had to add uh, an aluminum oxide layer with a uh, deposit of the atomic layer deposition to, uh, to isolate the layers from each other. In the case of titanium, that's not necessary because it does have an oxide, but there's some concerns because it also has conducting oxides. Although we, we haven't suffered from, uh, from leakage in this case. We showed this in more detail in, uh, in TEM. So these are TEM measurements from, uh, from Twente. You can all see a whole set of barrier gates and you can see that the interface between the palladium and the aluminum oxide is, is very sharp. I wouldn't call it atomically sharp, but at least it really leaves the aluminum oxide intact. Now we know that we should never uh, suffice with just a pretty picture. We also want it to work. So we made these quantum dot devices uh, and you can see in the upper right again, these two barriers uh, with this uh, layer uh, that goes over it. And then we could again create a uh, quantum dot as you can see this picture in the bottom. So again, we've got very sharp Coulomb diamonds with all these excited states inside them. Um, and it's relatively, uh, it's got a high charging energy meaning it's easier to measure quantum states, for example. Now, just one device doesn't mean it works. So we've made several devices. And what you see here are results, uh, measurements on uh, three devices from three different chips from three different fabrication runs. And in the upper right, we can see all these um, current voltage measurements and they're all very similar to each other. And then in the bottom, we see the, the, the current in color scale versus the two barrier gate voltages. And all of them show this very uh, quiet uh, set of Coulomb peaks uh, diagonal, which is, means that it's really in between the two barrier gates and only very few charge switches is the one right here. So based on this, we concluded that we could make low disorder quantum dots with these palladium gates. So we published this in, the, in scientific reports, but at the same time, there was a concern because we couldn't make p-type quantum dots. And when Matthias Browns, the first author of this paper was making these devices, he often uh, complained about, uh, about leakage between the p-type source range because we still have these ambipolar devices. We could make n-type quantum dots and p-type. And the first time you see leakage, it's annoying and you start making a, uh, a new device. The second time you make leakage, it gets even more annoying. And the third time you want to investigate what's going on. So that's what we did. And what we found out is that this layer of aluminum oxide gives us uh, this leakage in a very uh, um, uh, 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 reproducible way as well. So what we then made was devices without any gates on top. So what you can see here is that we deposited this aluminum oxide on top of the silicon oxide. And if we then measure that device without any gates, without any gate voltage at four Kelvin, we measure a two dimensional whole gas resistance, as you can see here, of about 50 kilo ohms. So we have a two dimensional whole gas without applying any electric fields. And what happens is the following. Uh, we get a fixed negative charge in this oxide stack. And we think it's at the interface of the silicon oxide and the aluminum oxide. And this fixed negative charge gets a positive image charge at the two dimensional, um, at the interface of the silicon, silicon oxide. The, uh, the two dimensional whole gas then gives us this 50 kilo ohms. We can get rid of it again by exposing it to, to UV ozone for about uh, 10 minutes or so, as you can see here on the right. So after 10 minutes, um, uh, we have again a resistance of more than, uh, than, than uh, 10 giga ohms or so. So we can get rid of this oxide. Um, we don't exactly know how it works. It's probably something in the aluminum oxide, um, but we do know that it somehow uh, neutralizes these charges. But then we started to work with uh, before with this two-dimensional whole gas, and we made a design similar to the classical design on uh, gallium arsenide quantum dots. So we make one layer of gates, as you can see in this picture here, gates X, Y, and Z, and then we can see if we can create a quantum dot. First thing we do is measure uh, current voltage characteristic uh, versus these gates. And we can see that we indeed have a finite current here at zero gate voltage. And then we can use, for example, gate Y and gate Z to completely pinch off the current. Similarly with the other pair of gates, X and Y. And then we could create a quantum dot right here in the heart of the device. And that's what you see in the measurement here and below. So this is a depletion mode whole quantum dot in intrinsic silicon. We then inverted the picture, and this is with a collaboration with Erwin Kessels from, uh, from Eindhoven. He, first of all, he's an expert in all of these ALD layers, and he had already shown that you could indeed get, as you can see here, negative fixed charge 
in uh, if you deposit aluminium oxide on silicon oxide. But also we had this, uh, this stack of phosphorus oxide, aluminium oxide that could induce positive charges. And when we made those stacks on top of our devices, we could indeed get electron quantum dots, depletion mode electron quantum dots in our devices. Uh, but if I look at this measurement, to me, this is a very ugly quantum dot. In principle, it worked, but the charge intensity was so high that we couldn't get rid of them. So it was extremely difficult to make controllable quantum dots in this system. So what this means is that when you make a device, it's not just a matter of depositing a, a dielectric and a, and a metal. You really need to look very carefully at what this does to your entire device. What's the measurement you want to do? What's the experiment? What do you want to learn? And then based on that, you choose this combination of layers that's most suitable. And then, for example, aluminium has large grains, which can be negative, uh, and it eats into to the silicon oxide. It can be good or bad. The fact that it eats in means it, it sticks well, uh, which is, for example, a problem, can be a problem for palladium. So look carefully at how you'd like to, to, to design your experiment and then, then choose the, the materials that you'd like to know. And we've published this, uh, this paper on this, which we call uh, ourselves the, the silicon quantum dot cookbook, where, where we take many of these kind of uh, processes into account. For example, what happens during annealing, what happens during atomic layer deposition, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so with that, I'd like to uh, summarize my talk with uh, the setup slide with the, the key results. So the Polish pin blockade and the, the quantum dots in the nanowires, also the, the superconducting uh, uh, results in the, uh, in the germanium nanowires. I've shown you how I've been able to make low disorder quantum dots with palladium gates in, uh, in planar silicon and also depletion mode quantum dots in, uh, in undoped silicon. So with that, I'd like to uh, put up the most important people in, uh, in the group and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Flores, thank you very much for this, uh, this very nice talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but of course I have, I have a few questions. So maybe you can go one slide back um, because you have uh, it up there. So the supercurrent that you're seeing in these, uh, in these silicon germanium nanowires, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of structure on this. Do, do you understand all the, all the details of this or? So you mean these lines in the, the normal region? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very reproducible. It's very symmetric. Yes. So this must yes, be. Yes, and, and there's physics behind it. Yeah. So those right. are uh, multiple Andreev reflections. And since it is, um, they're normally at a constant voltage, and they really are. But this is, of course, a uh, current bias measurement. And what uh, the first author has done, and you can see that in, in the paper, is that he has replotted this uh, versus voltage. And these are all then uh, nearly horizontal lines, and they correspond to the to different modes of your uh, multiple Andreev levels. So you can number them uh, NS1, 2, 3, et cetera. So it's multiple Andreev reflections between the two superconducting uh, electrodes. And so is this governed by the, by the aluminum or the, or the nanowire? Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, so it's, it's the gap of the aluminum, but then uh, it's the, the length of the channel that then sets your uh, the specific, uh, the number of modes that can actually go up and down. OK, OK. Cool. That looks very nice. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pictures you always get with uh, these superconducting measurements. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, yeah, exactly. And I mean, your, your Coulomb uh, diamonds are really, really beautiful. I mean, it's very impressive. Thanks. Okay. Um, so while waiting for more people to ask questions, um, let me ask another one. So, of course, uh, you were also referring to my master thesis, right? So, so. <laughs> That, that reminded me that, um, of course, the whole idea of all these quantum dots in the end is to do quantum computation, right? Uh, or in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have you also uh, demonstrated like ESR or coherent spin manipulation? Or... Yes. So, so last year, we've had a, 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 a P type, a whole spin qubit in uh, one of these iMac devices, as a matter of fact. So not yet in the nanowires. In nanowires, we tried this. And uh, somehow, we didn't get the devices up and running. But uh, we set up this new collaboration with uh, the group of Dominic Zumbul in Basel. And they've actually realized spin orbit qubits in these uh, germanium silicon nanowires. That was published in Nature Nano a year ago or so. And our results on these, uh, these, these uh, whole spin qubits in, uh, in IMEC, we haven't published them yet because they're not far enough. And we just have a new uh, IMEC device ready that shows some nice uh, double quantum behavior. OK, cool. So, so what is the big challenge for the, for the nanowires? 
Um, so actually for the superconducting stuff, we are now trying to make, uh, what we first did is that we deposited this aluminum on top and then we had a short anneal step. And then the, what happened is that the aluminum diffused partially into the germanium nanowire. And what we now do is that we have found a new trick that we can still keep the aluminum on, on top and have uh, the supercurrent to leak into the nanowire. That's not trivial because we have to go through the silicon shell. And we have, we've had a PhD who's been trying for a year to, to do this with all these different recipes. And now we find the magical recipe. Uh, so that works. And that means that we can, um, what we want to do is to um, use the silicon shell to avoid what we call metallization. And metallization means that uh, the semiconductor takes up the properties of the metal, especially, of course, if you get the metal into the nanowire. And if you want to use this high spin orbit coupling to, to uh, for example, try to prove topological states, then you don't want to have the, the metallic properties, you want to have the, the semiconducting properties. So that's what we want to get to now, to actually need use these, these, uh, these semiconducting properties to go towards topological states. So, so you have to tune like the, the proximity effects to... Exactly, yeah. So we want to, so we, we have uh, different batches with different silicon shell thicknesses. And of course, the thicker the shell, you'll prevent this metallization more, but it will also be more difficult to let the supercurrent to look into. So it's really finding the balance and we're not even sure if it's possible to have that balance between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clear. Let me see there are some questions. So Aaron is asking, uh, you showed a variety of results on different systems. Can you comment on which are most promising for integration into scalable fabrication processes? Ah, so honestly, I think it should be germanium um, uh, and actually planar germanium. So that's what, what we hope to do in this, this new uh, proposal. Let's see if I can, uh, uh, I think it's only a single slide with a only fancy cartoon. So germanium allows us to, um, um, yeah, that's definitely not a picture of a device. So uh, uh, of course, silicon has been the big breakthrough for, for, for IC technology. And the key was then that, that the silicon oxide could be grown, which is very difficult for germanium. But by now, and that's why you, you've got this entire IC technology and uh, people are finding it difficult to, ste to step back to go towards, for example, germanium. Although now it seems that germanium has the uh, superior properties, but uh, since silicon is so far up in the CMOS technology, they can't catch up anymore. But I think for quantum technologies, it might still be possible. And especially if you look at the results of uh, Menno Veldhorst's group from Delft in the last couple of years, who's been able to make four qubits uh, in germanium uh, published uh, uh, about a year ago, or this year earlier in, uh, in Nature. And I think that could be the, the material of choice. First of all, because of, you can make these spin qubits in germanium. And secondly, uh, it's also easy to integrate the superconduct, uh, superconductors. Because making superconduct, getting superconductivity in silicon is nearly uh, impossible as far as I've seen so far. Okay, and I guess the coupling to light, right? Should be possibly easier. Possibly easier. So what uh, uh, last year, Ig Bakker's grew hexagonal germanium silicon, and it, but it really has to be a, 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 an alloy. So it's about 60% germanium and 40% silicon. So in that sense, you need uh, the best of both, I guess. Right. Okay, there's another question uh, from Sergio Valenzuela. Um, how do you determine that spin flips and the spin, spin blockade are due to spin orbit interaction? Ah, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a relevant question. So we studied the, the, the leakage current in poly spin blockade. And if you look at the leakage current, then it's the, the quantitative current uh, due to these spin flips. And of course, the, the more spin flips per second you have, the more current you have. And if you study this as a function of magnetic field, you can get, for example, a, a peak as a function of magnetic field or a dip as a function of magnetic field. Uh, if you get a peak, then it's uh, that's a signature for the hyperfine interaction being the limiting factor for the spin flips. And then the width of that peak is, for example, a direct measure for the hyperfine interaction strength. If you get a dip as a function of magnetic field, and then the dip is at zero magnetic field, and that's a signature of spin orbit coupling being the limiting uh, factor. And that's exactly what we saw on one of those measurements. So versus magnetic field, and I think it was only in one direction, in the, the X uh, direction or so, uh, we saw indeed a dip, which was indeed a signature of uh, spin orbit uh, coupling. And then you need a specific model for the, the spin flips um, to need to find out that it's a peak or a dip that gives you this, uh, this signature. Okay.
It's a well-known paper by uh, uh, Jeroen Danon and Yuri uh, Nazarov, who, who explain all these different mechanisms, uh, hyperfine and, and spin orbit, and how they then result in uh, in the specific signature versus magnetic field. Okay, good. Um, I see that there are no more questions in the Q&A, nor in the chat. Um, I also think we're at the right time maybe to, to stop this session. So um, I would like to thank you again very much, Flores, and also Isaac for both your, um, your presentations. And uh, so Flores, for you, um, there's another link that you can open to have some discussion with uh, some people at ICN2. Great, so yeah, think... thanks for the invitation. And it was my pleasure to, to speak. Uh, anyone also, people who are not coming, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or are uh, interested in any future prospects. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone.